What's good, my people? I hope this finds you and yours doing very well indeed. Uh, this is the inaugural and perhaps only, we'll see, uh, entry into a series I'm tentatively calling Shit YouTubers Stay. Or something like that. Um, I haven't made up my mind or my body. You know, the inaugural episode here, it's um, a response to an Adam Neely video. And let me start off by saying that Adam Neely is someone who I truly respect in terms of, you know, popular YouTubers. Uh, his meme craft is second to none. I mean, it's level 10 cleric stuff going on over there. And his depth integration of discussions about music theory, culture, and contemporary political contrivances is second to none. In most cases, it's quite beyond re reproach. I'm particularly fond of his critiquing of the ways in which music theory in the West tends to protect and insulate around it, around the status quo of Eurocentric composers and sacred cows from the classical period, while eschewing acknowledgement of non-Western traditions. I also quite enjoyed his recent debunking of the pervasive myths about the tritone interval, Satan's interval, or whatever. I thought that was quite good. And in some ways, uh, this latter example is uh, was the inspiration for my doing this video. Because... You see, there's another insidious bit of cultural relativism that's been bandied about as a fact uh, for the past 50 years or so, but doesn't actually hold up under historical scrutiny. Uh, let's get into this. Adam's recent super fast Instagram Q&A featured a question from one of his subscribers about today's music versus the conventions of the past, which nearly began his response with uh, this quote, for a change to a new type of music is something to be aware of as a hazard for all our fortunes. 380 BC, people have been talking about the kids these days with their newfangled music for literally thousands of years and have been framing it as kind of like a moral question since then. Now, it's true that certain aspects of platonic thought are bent towards a type of conservatism, uh, but as a member of the oligarchy, uh, Plato would go on and would be more than willing to subjugate the cultural norms of his own Athenian culture and paradigm for those of the conquering Spartans to come. But let's leave that whole, you know, master, slave, um, BDSM conversation for another day and, and focus on whether or not Neely is right when he extrapolates from the quote from Plato that literally for thousands of years now, right up to the present day, people have been afraid of the music and by extension the culture that the young folks are all brewing. Well, let's first take a short side step, if you'll go with me now, down the smoky hall from the question of music specifically, and we we're going to instead look at the more general question, you see. Uh, the more general questions about uh, ageism come, you know, say, circa mid-20th century. Was Hollywood's use of middle-aged male leads in Bogart and McCall classics and so on of yesteryear due to a sort of proto Swinestinian creepy old dude Lolita thing, you know, that sort of fetish or whatever? Was this seemingly Nabokovian trope based on other factors? Hmm. Dun, dun, dun. Well, of course, the answer is simple. The reason for this discrepancy in age between the male and female leads in these pictures was due to the fact that all the young men in the country who were in good health were either deployed in the Pacific or European theaters of World War II. I started out by taking us down this tangent as a way to frame my rebuttal uh, in several ways. First up and foremost is to challenge the notion that youth culture has always been the dominant cultural norm, with an example from the not-too-distant past that was easily relatable to a modern audience. And secondly, I wanted to frame that period that tr I wanted to highlight that period, rather, that transitions from the Great Depression to that of the post-war period, so-called American hegemony, which brings us up to the present day. You see, the modern obsession with all things young pretty much begins with that post-war period and the baby boomers. And the corresponding advancements in technology of mass communication and subsequent use of those technologies on the part of private business to advertise their products. The boob tube, you know, the, and, and then the other aspect of that is you have, to, you have to understand 
before this period, you know, they weren't targeting the baby boomers or the, the kids before that because they had no money when they were kids or a way to have an income. They hadn't figured out how to make them want something so badly they would drive their parents insane until they bought it for them up to this point, among other things. Um, but uh, it is striking uh, to note that prior to the period of the baby boomers and all the way up to the present day, and the modern means of communication, now it must be said without magazines, newspapers, radio, and television, and other forms of advertisement vehicles for advertisers to use, then they wouldn't have been able to, to you know, uh, elicit the types of uh, responses that they were able to. So that, that must be said as well. But let me, let me move on. These businesses were bolstered by their earlier incorporation of psychological research, beginning with the hiring of Sigmund Freud's nephew, Bear Nays, by the cigarette companies, as they tried to figure out how to sell cigarettes to the newly and untapped market that would have presented itself in terms of the suffragette movement. They, uh, women had been excluded from smoking before this point in history. And so the freedom torches of the time were born. Those free purchases were nowhere near as sophisticated as the ads that would come, but they parallel nicely with the ways in which the next victims of the advertising machine were exploited in the modern era, namely the baby boomers. To be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. We are a product of our culture, and music is a reflection of the culture. And if you don't see yourself in the culture, you feel like something fundamentally is wrong. And that's always going to happen. As time marches forward, the previous generation is not going to be able to see themselves reflected back in the culture. So damn kids these days with their, with their TikToks. So Neely's use of Old Man Simpson here is particularly interesting as he doesn't know what it was and, and so on. That's because outside of being young and having some sort of importance that the advertising agencies were clever enough to keep uh, from being explicit, the, 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 the thing about young people is they're far more easily separated from their dollar bills than someone who's an adult. So even a young adult or teenager kid, they don't have that same... Uh, you know, wherewithal about themselves. They're much, it's much easier to seduce them into, into spending their money. And so uh, that's why the demographic studies that are associated with primetime television, for instance, how many 18 to 40 year olds are watching it? Because guess who's going to spend that money? You see, it's not because they have any particular sway politically or socially or culturally, or should rather have any real bearing on the culture. But again, I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. The post-war period was one which saw the birth of suburbia, as the returning GIs used their GI Bill to build a Frank Lloyd Wright design ranch-style home. But did you know that before Better Homes and Gardens coined the phrase living room, that no such designation existed? So, while selling these young homemakers on the products of consumption and technology, which would make their lives easier, they also would include images of models and illustrations of women, which exemplified a type of, shall we say, platonic ideal of what womanhood stood for, which simply didn't represent what most women actually look like. But further than that, it created unhealthy and unrealistic notions of what one's body ought to look like. And all the other advertising which had incorporated Freudian's pseudo-psychiatry up to that point it all stemmed from a type of male fantasy paradigm, which would ultimately help on a certain level to medicalize misogyny in the 20th century and in mental health institutions. But the other thing which corresponded to this new concept of reality was the fact that World War II hadn't actually touched the remote shores of American business and industry. And so the forthcoming period of the American hegemony was afforded the historically unprecedented position of being able to provide the world the materials to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And its foil in that post-war era, which also shared a keen uh, notion that they wanted to have imperial dominance over the world, was that of the Soviet Union. And, but they had based their system on this bastardized version of communism 
which was ultimately co-opted by the totalitarianism of Joseph Stalin. Uh, so that while on the one hand the capitalist pigs would be able to provide all this stuff, that's, that was a little more difficult in that communist structure. Let's leave the Cold War and out of it for right now and, and let's return to Mr. Neely, who summed up his response to the question of music and ageism by saying, chances are if you feel like you don't have a representative in the culture or you're, you're no longer a part of the place, then that's just the way it is. And while I get partially where he's coming from in terms of the current political situation, uh, maybe, maybe, um, you know, I feel that it's well past time that we say, no, hold on a second. That's not the way it's always been. It just isn't. And ultimately, it's important that we understand that and maybe can, that way we can see our own place in the world for what it really is. And in terms of expectations, how they have been by politicians and by business, private businesses have been corrupted to think of uh, outside of what is actually congruent with reality. I believe it's well past time to challenge the assumption that the norms that were established since the post-war period ended throughout the period of the American hegemony and Cold War, these expectations about, you know, the future and, 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 and so on and consumption um, and, you know, everything. I mean, I may be an old guy. I may seem like an old guy. Oh, you know, youth culture. No, look, we have to stop with the norms that we've already had established. And so I'm just wanting to put a flag out there and say, hey, it's not always been this way. Because it hasn't. I appreciate you all listening to what I had to say. You know, uh, thank you so much for watching if you made it this far. Um, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and leave me a comment down below on whether or not you like this kind of thing. I ought to be spending my, and should it be something I ought to be spending my time on? Um, be good or be good at it. Later.